Thank you, Jesus. You know, we're just, I'm getting, tonight's going to be a little bit different. Y'all can be seated, but the kids, I don't know that the kids even have to be distant. They can stay. The kids can stay. <laughs> Electronics wasn't working in. Hallelujah. Music ministers, if y'all need to take a seat for a second, but you can even keep playing. You can even keep playing softly if you want. Whenever we were here, I was I was going to talk again about the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about the, the, the gifts of prophecy. And, you know, where we stopped last time, well, what we started was 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And how the scripture says, but he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So when you and I get saved, I just want to talk to you a little bit about a few different scriptures. And then we're going to worship the Lord some. Whenever you and I get saved, it's important for us to understand that it's in our spirit, man, that the Lord comes alive on the inside of us. The Word of God teaches in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 27. And I mean, if you want to put some of these scriptures up, that's fine. But in that particular passage of scripture, the Word of God teaches us that God promised that there would be a new covenant that was going to come. And in the new covenant, that what was going to happen, he says he's going to sprinkle you with blood. So this is 700 or so years before Jesus ever walked on the earth. He said, I will sprinkle you with water is what it says. But the water is talking about the water of purification, which comes from the ashes of the red heifer. Now, with the ashes of the red heifer, the whole heifer, which is a female cow, was burned with the blood in it. And so what I need you to know is not, it's not a type of baptism. It's a type of what Jesus would do at the cross. So that within the purification waters, the blood was contained therein. The Bible even says it in the book of Hebrews that Moses sprinkled all the articles in the tabernacle. That all things were cleansed with blood in the Old Testament also. And so that water of purification represented the cross of Jesus. He said, I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water. And then he said this, I'm going to renew your spirit. He said, I'm going to take your heart of stone out. I'm going to put a heart of flesh in you. I'm going to renew your spirit. And I'm going to put my spirit on the inside of you. And then I'm going to cause you. To walk according to my statutes and my judgments. Statutes and judgments represent the word of God. For Israel in the Old Testament, they had the law. They had the word of God. For Christian in the New Testament, we have both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Testament, the New Testament. But what I want you to know is that God's word was alive in Jesus. Amen. And he sent Jesus to the earth. Hallelujah. And that from there, he's given us the written word that talks about Jesus. And I want you to know that when you and I get saved, that living word comes alive on the inside of us. He causes our spirit, man, to come alive. He puts his spirit on the inside of us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 17, you can put that one up there, Haley. I want you to see it. It's a simple verse. As she's getting it up there, I want you to, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says this. It says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. One spirit. The spirit of God lives inside the spirit of man. If you're saved tonight, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And that's where he lives, inside of your spirit. Man. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a believer that has struggled in your faith. I've been a believer that struggled in my faith. Amen. But I know I was saved. And all it took was one touch of the master's hand. Yeah. And when he touched me, hallelujah, hallelujah, the spirit in me came back alive because the spirit of the Holy Spirit came back alive. And whenever he came alive and I began to yield to him, hallelujah, he began to have his way. And as I began to yield to him more and more, step by step, he began to cause me to come even more alive. So I want to encourage you tonight that no matter where you are, no matter what you've been through, if you've ever been saved before, I got to tell you, I believe the Holy Spirit still lives on the inside of you. But depending upon how we live our life, and I want to get into that a little bit, depending on how we've been living our life, it can affect the condition of our spirit man. 
when we don't yield to the Holy Spirit, then it starts to cause trouble for our spirit also. And our spirit becomes more dormant to the things of God. But I got good news for you that if you and I will yield ourselves, then guess what? The Lord will start to work on the inside of us. Listen, the Lord died on the cross to give us victory in life. He did. He's already defeated the powers of hell. We have to learn to believe and to trust in what Christ has done. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'll give you a scripture here in a minute maybe, but it starts off talking about that the Lord, you know that the day of the Lord could come as a thief in the night. It can happen quickly. I don't know about you, but in my life that there's been times that the enemy has come against me and I wasn't expecting it. He was right around the corner and he was bringing his deception and he came just and he comes not but to steal, to kill and to destroy. But the Lord has come, hallelujah, that we might have life, not just any old kind of life, but life more abundantly. The Lord wants to give us life. See, many times when we think that there's peace and safety, it says even in the end, and then all of a sudden destruction. You and I all know in this place, we might have been taking a nap, but we should know spiritually that the days are dark. The days are dark. Time, listen, it's all over the news. The world is going crazy. And I have to tell you that it's bad out there. Yes. But the good news is that Jesus is still in control. Amen. Yes. The scripture, one of the next scriptures that we talked about last time was Jude ver- chapter 1 verse 20. And it says, but you beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. See, first I was talking to you about being saved. Now I want to talk to you about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's important that you and I are baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to make it to heaven even if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or at least we hope that the enemy don't get the best of you. But guess what? We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us on the inside. When we don't have another way to turn, we can call upon and begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will begin to build up our most holy faith. The Holy Spirit will begin to cause edification of building up on the inside of us. Another scripture that we talked about was actually Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And I, and I talked, that's where we ended actually. Where it talked about that the spirit groans. He makes intercession for you. Can you put that one up there for me, Haley? Romans 8 and 29. Romans 8 and 29, that's it right there. But you are not in the flesh. Well, that's, that's the wrong scripture. Sorry. What is it? 26, sorry. Uh, there we go. Likewise, the spirit helps our infirmities you know the word infirmity means weaknesses mm. i don't know about you but no no you i do know about you because i know about me and i know that we're human beings that's right, that's and outside right. of god outside the help of god we have infirmities yeah. the word infirmity one of the meanings of the word is a weakness yeah. see we are frail as human creatures left to ourselves yeah. good news good news god the father sent his son jesus hallelujah And now he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. You and I have the power of heaven at our disposal to walk in victory, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will learn to yield to him. But I want you to see this, that sometimes we're going through things in life. And whenever you have the Holy Spirit in you, guess guess what it says? That the Spirit will make intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Some people, we talked about it a little bit, and I'm not trying to get technical tonight. I just, I really don't have too much more I'm going to say. I just want to mention a couple of things. That the word right there is not really talking about necessarily praying in your heavenly language or in praying in tongues. But it's talking about something that's coming from the depth of your soul. Where I was going to bring you in 1 Thessalonians 5, you don't have to, to, to turn there right now. But what I wanted is, you can leave this up, but I wanted to say this. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. See, travail, it means great sorrow. Sometimes when we're burdened down because life is getting the best of us. Come on, somebody help me out, Christian. Because listen, as the pastor of the church, I can tell you, yes, I get up here and I call upon the Lord and I've been spending time in prayer and I get back there in that room and sometimes I can feel the heaviness. But guess what? It's not just that I'm feeling heaviness on y'all. It ain't like the enemy's not trying to mess me up. The enemy's trying to mess me up. 
He's trying to tell me that, that there's situations in my life and in my family that are hopeless. Right, right. But I'm here to tell you, he's a liar. Amen. He's a liar and the father of lies. And you and I need to learn some things. Because look, walking in darkness ain't going to get it done, my friend. Staying in darkness is not going to get it done. Trying to go to sleep in the midst of the, hard, the things that are going on, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go to sleep and then wake up and realize you slept the whole thing away and then now destruction is really upon us. No. But travail like a woman. The sorrow will lead you to get to this place right here where you will begin to allow the Holy Spirit to groan through you. Where you will begin to allow the Holy Spirit to utter things through you because look, you don't even know what to pray for. What am I going to do, Lord? I've been praying. It seems like I've been praying for five years, ten years, fifteen years. There ain't nothing really happening. But when you get along with the Lord, don't wait to come to church to pray, friend. Find some time alone with the Lord. Get up an hour early, but I'm not a morning person. No, you need to do this. You need to find time alone with the Lord. Maybe after the kids are asleep. I don't know. But begin to cry out to the Lord and allow. Listen, some people say, oh, that's just your emotions. Well, guess what? Sometimes when the Holy Spirit starts to move on you, you get emotional. And let the Holy Spirit groan through you. What does that even mean? You get into the presence of the Lord. You'll know what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit is going to want to pray through you. He's going to want to speak things through you that you won't even you won't even understand what he's doing. The enemy wants to keep us in darkness, child. In 1 Thessalonians 5, we can go to this. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5. It says, first in verse 4, you don't have to go to that, but that's whenever he said it, go, it, it should not overtake you as a thief. You know why? Because you're not of the, you're not of the, the night. You're the children of light. Jesus, whenever he came, he said this. He said that you are the light of the world. When you put your faith in Christ, the word of God teaches that Jesus came to live in you. He transferred his light to you. And now the light of Christ is in you. He said you shouldn't be overtaken like a th by the thief because you're the children of the light. You're of the day. You're not of the night nor of the darkness. Verse 6, he says, therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Listen to me, Christian. There's a lot of people in the church that are sleeping. And I promise you, I'm not trying to be critical. Lord knows that I've been critical enough. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to just be real. People still don't like to hear, but the church is in a, the church is in a mess. I'm talking about overall, the church been in a mess. Right? Uh, but, but, the, but the Lord wants his people to be awakened. But the people that sleep, they sleep in the night. But we're of the day. He's talking about spiritual sleep now. He wants his people to wake up. The people that are drunk, they're drunk in the night. I was thinking about this when I was praying earlier today about being a vessel, right? And you know, the scripture talks about in Ephesians chapter five, I believe it's verse 18. It says, be not drunk, which is excess, but be ye filled with the spirit. And in the Greek language, the idea is be being filled. The idea is, is that it's a continuous ongoing action. That when you and I as the children of God, we need to avail ourselves to be filled with the spirit of God. What happens when you drink alcohol? I mean, some of you be like, well, alcohol never touched my lips. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, what, what happened to me back when I used to drink alcohol was that that alcohol would get into my bloodstream and it would begin to diffuse through me and it begin to change the way I thought, change my thinking. I couldn't see near as well as I was seeing before I started drinking. I couldn't hear as well. I lost my sense of direction many a times. I know y'all probably didn't drink as bad as I did. I mean, I wake up in place I didn't even know what happened. in the world did I get here? Drinking alcohol will do that to you. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that when you start to drink of the Holy Spirit, Yes. When you start to avail yourself to drink of the Holy Spirit, a similar thing happens. The Holy Spirit in you rises up in you. He begins to diffuse through you. He begins to change the way you think, change the things you see, change the way you hear. The Holy Spirit will give you ears to hear, eyes to see. Hallelujah. And He, the living Word living in you, will lead you and guide you. In all truth, He will do that for you because He loves you. Let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. 
You know, in Ephesians chapter, I believe it's Ephesians chapter 6, I think it is. Ephesians chapter 6. Yeah, Ephesians 6, 14. Can you put that up there? So in 1 Thessalonians 5, it talks about the breastplate of faith and love. But in Ephesians, it says the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I want you to know this, that faith results, faith in the right thing results in, the, in righteousness. Faith in Christ. The word of God teaches this in Romans chapter 3. It says, now the righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed. What do you think Paul was talking about? See, the law was God's standard of righteousness in the old covenant. But what Paul is saying is this, is that now the true righteousness of God has made his presentation upon the earth. He's already gone to the cross. He's ascended to heaven. And now you need to understand the true righteousness of God is Jesus Christ. And when you put faith in Christ, hallelujah, and you got saved, you've now been clothed with the armor, the breastplate of righteousness. And it's all through faith in what he did for you when he died for you. Then he goes on to the next verse right here. What is it? Verse 15. And he talks about, I'm sorry, go up, uh, go up on the, the belt of truth. Go up to 13. Well, it's in there. You know what I'm talking about. The belt of truth. Well, this is the idea. The idea is this, is that the, the soldier would wear the belt of truth and that the breastplate would be tucked in there and it would hold it in place. The truth of God's word helps to hold the righteousness of Christ in the right position. The enemy is going to come against you. The Word of God teaches that the enemy, he has like fiery darts. The lies of the enemy are like fiery darts. Every time you turn around, and listen, I'm not here to pick on your social media, your television shows, whatever, your music. I, that's not what my point is, but my point is, I'm going to pick on you. So why? Because those are where fiery darts will originate. The world is saying one thing. The Word of God says another thing. When the enemy keeps trying to shoot those fiery darts, the breastplate of righteousness, which is Christ that we wear, is to protect us. The belt of truth is what helps to keep it in place. Because as we navigate the journey in this world that's full of lies, yes, yes. the world is full of lies. Why? Because their father is the devil. <laughs> and, the Bible, and Jesus said, your father's the devil. He told that to the Pharisees. He said, and basically that's the only language he knows how to speak is lies. But Jesus is truth. He's the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. So I want to just tell you this. Continued faith in Christ allows that breastplate to continue to hope in the truth. I, I, listen, I, I'm not, I don't want you to really raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. How many of you are truly in the word of God? Okay, listen, just... It's a point. It's a point to be made. I'm, and you got to be careful. We're not preaching legalism. We're not preaching works-based Christianity. I'm not preaching to you that if you read three chapters tonight, that tomorrow you're going to have your victory. That's not what I'm preaching. I'm preaching to you that Jesus already won the victory for you. But if you don't get into the word, you're not going to know what Jesus has done for you. You're not going to know what about, about life, about life. You're not going to know the truth versus the lie. You're not going to know how to combat the fiery darts of the enemy. You're going to be able to, you're going to be susceptible to the lies of the enemy. We have to, as the children of God, put the word of God on the inside of us. Amen. This is where I'm going to end right here. And then we're going to worship the Lord. Thank y'all for y'all's patience. Hallelujah. Verse 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Now may the, God, may the very God of peace. No, I don't know about you, but I love peace. I love the peace of God, man. Y'all yes, yes. know what I'm talking about. Whenever we, like, look, I, 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 y'all don't need me to walk over there and open up that door. Yeah, we do. We, I know I do it so much, and it's kind of getting comical, but the Word of God says in Ephesians 4, 27, don't give a place to the devil. And so we open up the door to give a place, and we just want to take a peek out there. I keep thinking somebody's going to be there, but they're not. <laughs> 
And whenever we try to close it, the enemy, he, put, he, get, he would give him a foothold. Whenever we open the door like that, somebody's not closing the door. Again. Whenever we open the door to the enemy like that, it never closes back shut as quickly as what we want it to. I'm not trying to strike fear in your heart. I'm trying to give you some understanding about how this some of these spiritual things work. We think we're just going to take a little peek, but we're opening up the door. And the Lord loves you and I. You might be watching tonight. Listen, the Lord loves you. Yeah. And you're like, well, it don't feel like it. Well, hold on a second now. Hold on, boss. <laughs> you might have opened the door thinking you were just going to take a peek, and now you gave the devil a foothold. You gave place to the devil. He don't, listen, victory is in Christ. You, many times what we really need to do is we just need to come to the place of repentance. And sometimes it takes time for the Lord to allow us. Like the children of Israel, they were stiff-necked, they were hard-hearted. Is it okay if I say that? I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about them. Stiff-necked, hard-hearted, they said, in one place it said their head was like a flint. Rebellious. I don't know about you, but that's been my life at times. But the Lord knows how to even use that in our life to bring us to a place where we're like, no, really, Lord, really, 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 I want to serve you. And I need your help. I need your help. So what was I trying to say? The God of peace. Peace is a beautiful thing. When we open the door, we allow in chaos. But then when we start to close the door, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Submit to the will of God. Submit to the work of God. You can't fight the devil on your own. Submit to the truth of God's word. Jesus has defeated him. Submit to the truth of God's word that when you walk outside of Christ, that repentance must come. Pour your heart out to the Lord. Amen. And then there, instead of chaos, peace. Peace enters in. Hallelujah. And then it goes on to say, the, may the God of peace sanctify you whole. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body pre be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just real quick, I want to talk to you about this sanctification. You know what sanctification means? It's a fancy church word. But you know what it means? It means to be made holy. It means to be made separate. God expects that his people be separated from the world. It's very clear in the Bible. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God expects his people not to live like the world. Now, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has already done the work at the cross. He paid the penalty for sin. He gave you and I access. One of those songs that they sang about you tore the veil. As a matter of fact, that'd be a good one to sing again. Didn't you sing that tonight? Uh, yeah. Okay. You tore the veil. You made a way. He made a way for us to get into the presence of God where there is peace, where there is hope, where there is life. And listen, the Spirit of God wants to sanctify us. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to purge us. He wants to sanctify everything about us. He wants to, and, and listen, the Spirit of God, you remember I said this, the Holy Spirit's alive inside, inside of your spirit. But sometimes... And it's not just even always our flesh. I'm starting to realize this. I've really been digging deep into this soul stuff. The soul which entails the mind, the will, the emotions. There's a lot of Matt Hebert. Yeah, it's sometimes connected to the flesh and that's automatically related to sinful activity. But sometimes even the good parts of Matt can get in the way. See, before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they only knew God. Then when they partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now they knew good and evil. And sometimes we'll even let our good get in the way. We'll try to help God out. I'm going to help you out right here, Lord. I got this. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit on the inside of us wants to be in control. And the more we yield to him... And the more we learn to hear his voice, we need to start. Listen, I'm about to stop. I promise you. Let, let me just get this part from me. Let me just say this and, you, and then we're going to worship. We need to learn how to hear the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and our own voice in our head. Because sometimes we have good intentions, but we get in the way of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. 
And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to speak to our heart and mind. And he wants our body parts to follow what he's saying. But many times we don't like what the Spirit's saying. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why we don't like what the Spirit's saying. Because the Spirit's saying self must die. Self must be crucified. But I have all these aspirations. I have all these dreams. I have all these ideas. If it lines up with the will of God, fine. But what if you're holding on to something? What if I'm holding on to something that's preventing us from God's best for our life? And the very things that we cling to prevent us from allowing. He laid his life down. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He died for me. Now the Holy Spirit is asking me to die in Christ so that he can live through me. Because if I stay, people aren't going to be able to see the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Amen.